Today we're going to, and tonight we're going to talk about, the whole program is going to be about questions and answers. We're just going to entertain your questions. I'll make comments in between. And sometimes they're not really answers as much as responses. Some questions don't have answers. But we do try to answer the question, and then we question the answer. I get more uh, education for, in my soul when I, when I question my answers. It takes, it takes a talent to answer questions, but it takes genius to ask them. And questions are answers in seed form. There is a harvest after them. So keep asking them. You cannot quest for God or good and never ask questions. Something we were forbidden to do coming up in our religious persuasions. Many of us, and there are millions of us, who are coming to a new awakening and a bright new morning is on us. And we're so thankful. And I know that you are too. So thanks for being here. Call your friends and say if you have questions. Some of them are gonna, are, have been sent in. Others you may uh, question while we're on the live program tonight. And we're going to do our best to, to get everyone that we have time for. But to start us off tonight, we have, for the first time on our program, we're going to continue to have music and presentations each week that I think would, uh, they add an energy to the house that, that is not here without them. We love music, and I know that many of you do as well. Brianna Wright and Parker Farrell from the band Nightingale are here tonight. Parker's on the acoustic guitar. He actually makes guitars and builds them, so he better be good or we're going to throw a shoe at him. No, I know he's good, or we wouldn't have had him here in the first place. And Brianna is quite known in the Tulsa area. I saw her live on um, at a, some, some big concert out in a big area with, with people sitting and listening to her, and I, it got my attention right away. Jason, who directs this program, found her, and we're so glad to have both of them tonight. They're beautiful people, wonderful spirits, excellent energy, and you're going to enjoy them. And they're going to play the song, These Dreams. Did you write it or? or? Yeah. Oh, you wrote the song? Yes, sir. Wow, they wrote the song. Uh, I was going to say I wrote part of it, but I didn't. I have dreams, <laughs> and these are part of our dream tonight. So enjoy, sit back and enjoy them, and then we're going to come back and go right into answering some of these interesting questions that are on the program tonight. Those in the studio, let's just clap because we got some good music in here tonight. All two of you in the studio. All right. <laughs> I don't want to give up on 
amazing. I love it. <laughs> you could do a whole concert. Your energy is really high. <laughs> love you. it. What, what a wonderful mix you kids are. You, I say kids not in a disrespectful way, but they just babies. When you get, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a full-fledged, bona fide senior citizen, whatever that means. So uh, I thank you for that. They're going to come back in a little bit with another song or two. And uh, in fact, just tell us briefly, you're, are you native Tulsans? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we're from here. I was born and raised, born and raised. Where? Uh, Tulsa, right here in Broken Arrow. I was oh my born. gosh. Yes, sir. Well, I didn't know that. I, I thought uh, y'all don't seem like Tulsans, but oh. what does that mean? Born and bred. <laughs> no, we're, Tulsa is just burgeoning. We're just becoming much more of a bright, attractive, a world-class city. I think we should be a, sort of a consular city where we one day actually have a consular here, a council for a uh, consul, I should say, for uh, foreigners and people who are migrating into our country. This is very beautiful. There were, by the way, like 600 demonstrations in this country this weekend, this past weekend, over American concerned about children's families being separated and um, that I'm so proud of the Americans all races all cultures all creeds gathering in the streets from LA to DC uh, protesting the 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 policies of the Trump administration regarding how we handle people who want to come to this place and space it's interesting that most of the mass murderings and killings in our country have been uh, per perpetrated in this country by white Americans, men, not foreigners, not ethnic people. Um, we wouldn't want people just tracing all the, the white men uh, in this country and arresting them because, uh, racially profiling them because so many of the, the murders, the mass murderings have been been perpetrated by that. That's, that's a crazy way of thinking. So we need to, this is a wake up call in so many ways and we're just praying and thinking and as, uh, as come Monday members we are cultural creatives. We're social activists and sacred, I call us sacred activists. We are spiritual progressives. We care about our country. We don't just want to make a difference in the world. We would like to help create a different world. One that is, that smiles more. One that is more congenial. One that is more livable and lovable. Especially here in America where the tensions are extreme. We've never quite had so much protestation of any particular uh, administration in the history of the country. There's something really different occurring, and it's uh, ultimately going to be okay. It's just tension and stress and such a polarization of our country. The polarities are extreme more than ever. We have elections, so there's tension. Sometimes the kind of collective tension that we're experiencing causes natural disasters and storms because the earth seems to respond to the energy of the people on it. And there are earthquakes and tremors and, of course, a few volcano uh, eruptions. And there are other things that are simmering underneath that may explode over the next few months. So uh, brace yourself to ride the storm out, to go and grow with the flow, even when the flow becomes a flood. That's one of my personal mottos that has been for the last several years. We can manage this. We can master this. We have to make the change, manage the change, and then master it. And so we're not really in trouble. We're just in transition as a people. We're in transition as a place. We're in transition as individuals. And I've embraced that my whole life. Um, and then more, more uh, uh, aggressively the last 15 years when I've gone through such a major transition, it's been very powerful. I don't care how bad it seems or gets for you, it does get better. Whoever you are, whatever you're uh, enduring, whatever you're surviving, it always gets better. And I always remember the statement by my uh, esteemed uh, uh, psychiatrist and writer, um, Viktor Frankl, who uh, lived until his 90s. He died in Germany. He was a psychologist and a Holocaust survivor. And he, he, he made this powerful statement, to live is to suffer. To survive is to find meaning or significance in the suffering. To find a sign meant or a sign a signal in the suffering. So whatever you're going through, there's a signal in there. There's a sign for you. You're going to make it just fine. Hang tough, hang turf, and don't look back. All right, here's a question. Hey, Bishop, a former theology student at Liberty University, but I have embraced your beliefs. I am a former, a former theology student. I call theology God thought and God talk. Theo is the Greek word for God, logos, is utterance or thought or conversation or logic, the logistics of divinity. I am a former theology student at Liberty University, but I have embraced your beliefs. I salute you, sir that, or ma'am. That's pretty astounding. Uh, but it's scary. Good point. 
and oftentimes I'm confused and I feel alone. What advice would you give me? I believe in God and the Spirit, but not the gift of the Bible. I'm very confused as to what I believe. What advice would you give me? Hang tough right there, little man or woman or old man or woman, whoever you are. You're right where you need to be. You're right in that place, in that space where you're curious and you're, cor you're courageous. That is your heart. The word courage comes from the word cardian, Greek, which means the heart. You are going through a heart shift and a heart change, but it's affecting your head shift and your head change. Actually, your heart knows that a lot of what you believe is inaccurate. Your heart has always known the truth. I think we come to this planet or this plane of consciousness knowing the truth, but then we forget it between the womb and the tomb, and we start believing what we're taught and told that sometimes is in defiance of what the soul knows. So you're at the place, my friend, where your soul is tugging, demanding your attention. Tension creates attention, which leads to intention. So the tension you are feeling is purposeful. The tension you are feeling is directed. The tension that you're feeling is corrective. I went through it too for many years before I publicly, verbally uh, mentioned it to a crowd of several thousand people whom I lost right after that. But they're now beginning to come back by the thousands. They're asking questions. Some feel the energy or the spirit of what I'm saying, though the, the words that I'm saying doesn't quite make sense because we are dealing with at least 2,000 years of entrenched indoctrination. And practice doesn't just make perfect. Practice tends to make permanent. When you practice a certain habit or hobby or hunger for a certain amount of time, it literally becomes part of you. And then when you separate from it, it's like an amputation of some type. And you feel crippled. You feel lame. You feel limp. You've lost a limb. And that's okay. You're going to start reading. And when the student is ready, as it said for, for many centuries, the teacher appears. There's a master coming into your life, maybe in a book, in a conversation, something you find on the net, something you see on television. But you're going to be surrounded by ancestral wisdom. Ancient wisdom is going to embrace you and listen, meditate, and allow your soul to have medication, healing from erroneous thoughts and things that threw you off cadence and into some kind of decadence. You started feeling the death and the dying of the position that you once held. You're going to be fine. Stay tuned. Just listen to many of the lectures we have. I have a couple of books out there. One's called The Gospel of Inclusion. The other one's called God is Not a Christian or Jew, Muslim, Hindu. God is with us, in us, around us, as us. That is a very long stretch for a guy that spent the first 50 years of his life as a rudimentary, fundamentalist, classical Pentecostal Christian. You know, pew jumping, devil thumping, Bible toting and quoting and sending everybody to hell, but my mom and him. So uh, I've expanded to love everybody, and it's the greatest freedom I've ever had. So keep sending questions, and let's just keep the conversation going. Pastor, another question. Many say that if you don't believe some of the Bible, you won't believe any of the Bible. What should we believe and not believe, and then why? Excellent question. Let me tell you about the Bible, first of all. Most people call it, we've been taught that it is the inspired word of God when it's really more of the inspired word of man about God. And some of that is now expired. I mean, it's irrelevant. It doesn't relate to the culture or the character of the human being. There's some wonderful stories in it. I take the Bible seriously. I just don't take it literally. The Bible itself says the letter or literal kills spirit, gives life. And so you gotta understand that the Bible was written by Jews two primarily Jews about a Jewish understanding of divinity. When the Jews wrote it and when the Jews read it, they think it relates almost exclusively to them. Now, Christianity is a Jewish offshoot. Christ's logic, the messianic consciousness, came to us through Jews. And Jews have had a powerful influence on the religion, even though most of Judaism or the Hebraic culture doesn't embrace the New Testament, just the old. The Septuagint was which 70 uh, men or so about 72 men, men uh, scholars, archaeologists, linguists, theologians got together and uh, translated 
the Hebrew scriptures into Greek during the Greek empire because many of the Jews of the diaspora had forgotten the language of Hebrew and they didn't read the texts. So these men, all men, came together and translated it, both Old and New Testament, into the Septuagint and so that Jews could read the Bible, quote the Bible, and study it all over the world. So the Greek translation is a translation of of uh, ultimately of the of the of the Hebrew translation and then between there is the Latin Vulgate by the Catholic Church or the Latinos that's that's Italy Rome so you have the Egyptian Empire the Assyrian Empire the Persian Empire then the Greek Empire the Roman Empire and then maybe the Catholic Empire the Roman uh, the, the Holy Roman Empire that's we're part of that America the Western world is a part of that empire. So we have all these empires. It took, please hear me when I tell you, it took 300 years of men, no women, sitting around tables, drinking wine, some of them getting a little high, some of them getting drunk and cussing, and then discussing or arguing, debating over what books or what writings. And Hebrew has no paragraphs, no punction. It's not even considered a modern language. And we don't have any of the original manuscripts. Manus is the Latin word for Greek. There's no original manuscripts. It, we, we don't know where they are. We don't know even if they exist any longer. All we have are copies of copies and copies. And the most reliable ones, scholars deem, to be those who are the oldest, who may have been tampered with less. So we don't know what any of the original tests. We can't even prove that any of the Bibles uh, are, are uh, not forgeries. Because by the time we got those written with names on them, the people or the authors were dead. Some of them 40, 50, 70 years old, hundreds of years old. And so, uh, and it, then it, it, it was 1,400 years between Jesus and the Gutenberg Press when the Bible was mass produced, the 14th century. And even then, uh, probably 80 to 90 cent of the world's population was basically illiterate. They couldn't read. So that's why music and songs, they, we, we call oral tradition in theology, they, they orally spoke what they had heard. And some of it are rumors, or some of it, a lot of it is rumors. So we don't probably have, and you can say, well, it's by faith. I just trusted by faith. We walk by, say, uh, by faith and not by sight. Well, you can walk by faith and not by sight, but it didn't say walk by faith and not by sense. It's got to make sense. Common sense. Some of the things that we believe don't even make common sense. They don't even make dog sense. So we need to rethink what we believe and why we believe it and how those beliefs add to or subtract from the quality of our lives. So it's okay to, to evolve in your process of, of studying scripture. Again, study it, but don't just read the Bible literally. Read the history of the book, where it came from, how it came down to us. We don't know anything personally about the men who translated it or those who uh, decided what would be in the cane or the canon. Canon is that which we lean on and walk with superficially. And uh, there's a lot of words that have to be broken down over time. But anyway, I'm glad you're asking questions, and I'll try to answer them and then, then question my answers. We'll keep this up for a while, but that was a great question. So take it slow and uh, read it, and when it makes sense to your spirit, that's what you identify. Separating tradition from fresh revelation is not always the easiest thing, but it's the best to do. What's my, somebody says, what is my favorite translation of the Bible? Beginning to process to be, I, I'm beginning the process to be ordained in the Christian Universalist Association. Wow, I love what you are doing. Thank you, whoever sent that. Happy to be doing it. I have used the New International Version for about 40 years because one of my college professors at ORU was one of the translators and knew some of the others. It has been recently, I think, bought by Amazon and retranslated, and certain words, uh, I'm told, have been removed from that particular translation. I have not studied it carefully, but originally that, the New American Standard is a good one. Now, there's a difference in a translation and transliteration. Transliteration means you translate the letters, the alphabets of the languages in which the original copies were written. That takes a lot more work. You have to be very careful about... Um, uh, interpretations or paraphrases. One of the best is the, um, the Message Bible. If you just want a general uh, sort of uh, interpretation put in modern English of what the writers originally meant, it's fairly accurate, but it is someone else's interpretation, not necessarily directly from the original language, either Greek or Hebrew, in which it was written. Uh, and then, of course, Latin, because that's the dominated 
Catholic means universal. When you say Roman Catholic, you mean the Roman universal church. But Catholic is just the Latin word for universal church. I believe in the universal church. Uh, but, um, uh, and so uh, I'm a universalist Unitarian as well. I'm licensed also with the Church of God in Christ. I'm licensed with the United Church of Christ. Uh, nobody ever asked me for those licenses, so I study and get little things from all of them. So you're on a good, good path, but those translations will work. And again, try to be as spiritual and meditative as you can and find out what resonates with the cadence and syncopation of your soul. Not just your head, but what you feel about what you read. How, what kind of chemicals respond in your soul and system when you read it. That's also the spiritual and mystical aspect of studying scriptures. Another question, Bishop, I have followed you for years and I'm very proud of the stance you made and continue to make even when it costs you everything. How can we have such great resolve and not give in or give up when things get tough? What happened with me is my soul, and I believe that your soul, the word is nefesh in Hebrew and suke in English where we get the word psyche or psychology or thought. Um, when, when your soul, which carries the syllabus, any of you who have studied uh, in um, college higher learning, you know what the syllabus is. It is the course study. It is what you will, will, and class study, it's what you will cover in the course or cause of your life. Your soul carries that. And there's a syllabus inside you that if you want to know your cause and course in life, you must go in or go without. Go within or go without. You're lost until you become in intimate contact and connection to and with your soul, your, your spirit, your essence. When I say your essential self, I mean your, your uh, permanent rather than your accidental self. Accidents don't happen by choice, they happen by chance. Most people live their chance self, their accidental self, not their choice self. Your soul chooses, your soul, I think, chose you. And in some ethereal or maybe even pre-incarnate reality, you chose your soul and chose your course and your class and what electives you would take. There's a list of them in your soul. You're not demanded or commanded to take them. You are, your discernment suggests you take these particular electives. That's not the main course, it's not the main cause, but it enhances the main course and cause of your soul and of yourself. We are not just spiritual people. We're not just people or human beings looking for spiritual experiences, you've heard me say. We're spirit, not just spirits. We are spirit, essence, that are having an earthly or who are having an earthly encounter our earthly experience, and our soul has memory. Our soul remembers its essence. I call them um, divine deja vus. I can't prove this, I said by speculation and conjecture, that maybe, just, just consider the possibility that in some pre-incarnate reality, you agreed to come here, to this planet or this plane of consciousness, but forgot about it. That you actually entered a soul contract with creation or creator. You entered some kind of significant arrangement and agreed to come to this planet to experience and express your divinity. What if creation wanted to experience itself as a human and created us for that reason? I think you, you, you and there's a scripture even in, in the Bible where Jeremiah describes what he imagines to be an experience with God and he, he writes down what he says, God said to him, and that was this, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, called you, and appointed you. In your formless, skinless, sinless, endless self, uh, you connected with creation, with the intelligence and the science that created your being and later on your body. And you came to this plane in that body and as that body, and you now realize that life doesn't just happen to you, life happens through you, and life happens as you. The amnesia is when you're not awakened, you have not been regenerated, regened. Your genetics haven't been refreshed. You forgot your essence between the womb and the tomb. So what I call being born again is not 
repeating some phrase that you that that a preacher a preacher uh, recites to you, but it's when you awaken and arise. The word born again, the word again in the Greek renderings of the New Testament that, and I'm quoting the words recorded uh, by Jesus or that, 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 is, that is said Jesus uh, recorded, you must be born again. Nicodemus had come to him and said, um, Master, we know you're a teacher sent from God because nobody could do these miracles except God be with him. And then Jesus said, well, you, you, you must be born again. You must have had some kind of an awakening because the word again is the Greek word anothen, or we get the English word anather, other, or ether. You've had some kind of ethereal, transcendent experience, Nicodemus. You've awakened. He didn't know what Jesus meant. What do you mean, born again? I go a second time, my mother's. No, 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 no. Flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. He must be born of water and spirit. He's not talking about baptism. He's talking about the natural birth when the water breaks. Remember, you are 80% water when you're born. And as an adult, you become about 50 to 60%. Your brain remains 80%. You swim the first nine months of your life. You got, we got some kind of gills or something in there. And most of that water is urine. The amniotic fluids, about 80% urine. You... You came here and pissed off. See, and, 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 then, and then you had to, to learn how to deal with all that. Oh. Uh, that's, what, that's what the Lord showed me in a dream. Uh, <laughs> so there's an anger. There's some kind of a tension. You know, I call life a sexually transmitted dis-ease or disease, a, a tension. There's anxiety. And we treat that incurable disease we call life and Ultimately, terminal disease, because we all go through the transition we call death. It's, it's incurable, but it's not untreatable. We are in treatment. It's the word therapy. That's the Greek word for healing. One of the words is iomai, which is very infrequently used in scripture. The other one is therapeutical, where we get the word therapy. It means to attend to menially. The root word is therapon, which means janitor, a custodian. So we are in healing ministries. We're just janitors. You can call me bishop janitor or son of a bishop janitor, whatever you want to call me. But I'm here, and I do what I do, and it's fun. So uh, this is what all Come Monday is about, and we're going to continue to evolve in our consciousness of what that means. Moon Day, I'm doing uh, some intrinsic study on the moon and what its essence to the planet and to the universe is. It's quite interesting and quite mystical and quite spiritual. When I share it, you're going to love it. So uh, we're going to go to a Come Monday a promo to give you a little bit of an idea of what that means when you become a member of Come Monday. After that, we're going to come back and have some more music, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, the word music comes from the word muse, which means to think. So they're going to make us think. To amuse is the opposite, which means to stop thinking. And we need to do both. You need to know how to think and stop thinking. Some of you forgot that you stopped thinking. So start thinking again or rethinking, which means repenting. I'll tell you more about that later. Watch this promo. Then you're going to hear this precious a young woman and gentleman play the guitar and sing, and you're going to like it. See you in a second. Hello, everybody. I'm Carlton Pearson, and I am so excited about the beginning of ComeMonday.org. Come Sunday was the movie. Come Monday is the movement into broader enlightenment and life. And as a member of Come Monday, you'll receive one video each Monday for the entire year. That's 52 videos in total that you'll receive every Monday morning to get your week started out on a positive and powerful note. I will also be sending you one each email each day, Monday through Friday, that will support the thought of the week. That's 260 emails throughout the entire year to inspire the genius inside of you. We will also provide a private Facebook group so that we can all come together in a safe environment and discuss personal, pertinent, powerful issues. You will also receive a digital monthly newsletter full of interesting updates and current events and exciting pictures. And I also want to offer you special VIP access to all of my events when I'm in a city near you, because I love to meet my people. <laughs> And finally, we'll offer special pricing to cruises, concerts, live events, all for standing with us and becoming a Come Monday member. So sign up now at the special introductory rate of just $3 a month. That's just $36 for everything for an entire year. I think I'm going to sign up 
for that myself. You're on your way to greater enlightenment. I want to meet you there in consciousness. So go to your phones and computers now. Sign up and meet me come Monday. Some time trying to find an answer to clear my mind, and all I got for my pursuit was more illusions of the truth. But looking back, it's clear to see. song's titled that's isaac's song our friend isaac wrote it oh he wrote it yeah it's a really original title it took us days yeah. i love it <laughs> no. you named it after the writer oh yeah that that is the hebrew word for for laughter yitzhak actually when um when abraham told his 90 year old wife that she was gonna have a baby she said this is, are you kidding and she started laughing she said, don't even come in this thing i I can't hardly walk, and you're talking about kids at 90 years old. She started laughing. She thought it was a joke. That's where that name comes from. Sometimes uh, there are miraculous births in our lives at various times, and we don't even feel fertile. There were times when I felt so dry and empty, I didn't feel fertile, and things birthed in me. Uh, in Scripture, uh, again, Abraham <clears throat> had the worst, the, the greatest promise that was told him. He was actually told that his seed would be multiplied like the stars of the sky. <clears throat> which means it was nighttime because he said, come out of your tent and I'll show you your potential. Come outside the tent, your comfort area, and see the ceilingless sky with all these stars that you cannot even number. So that vision came to Abraham in the dark night of his life. That's why Moon Day or Monday, the concept, is so important we like to deal with people who are going through dark experiences, the dark night of the soul, and bring some light to you. Not only L-I-G-H-T, but to lighten the weight so you can bear it, because we're going to help you bear it. That's, that's what that's all about. Now, let me just ask you again. We didn't put your, your email address, and so we're going to do that. For those of you who want more of their music, uh, they have some projects already ready. 
Where do I tell them to go to? Facebook.com slash Nightingale Band. Facebook.com slash Nightingale Band. Yes. Facebook. We're going to put it on the screen for you so you can go and download their music. You can either get the whole CD or individual songs. We're working on our CD right now. That's what I was saying. They're working on their CD right now. Uh, so, but you can go to the site and learn how they're working on the CD, okay? So they got great stuff. They're, they got a whole band. And they're, this video, I want you to enjoy them more. Their music makes sense. It's original. comes out of their spirits or friends' spirits. <laughs> and I hope all their friends have decent spirits. I, oppose, I suppose they do. The energy is powerful. The music is enlightening. All right, how has the, somebody asked me, how has the release of the movie, Come Sunday, About My Life, changed my life? <clears throat> it was about an aspect of my life. It isn't my whole, uh, we're working on, uh, in conversation with people about documentaries that will trace the whole journey of my 65 years. Hard to put that in 90 minutes. It's even hard to put the 15-year period uh, that's in that particular Come Sunday version. One of the things I learned uh, from it, it has changed my life in a lot of ways, is that uh, what m supposedly millions of people wanted to mute the message they didn't want out, uh, secular groups came in and entities came in, and now it's on 117 million subscribers' possession. Anybody can watch it anytime for perpetuity. Uh, Netflix spent, I think, $17 billion last year in creating or buying new stuff. They bought ours, which was produced by Endgame and National Public Radio. My friend Ira Glass first edited an interview that was given to me uh, right here in Tulsa, right in the middle of my shift. And, I mean, shift happens, and mine had hit the fan. S-H-I-F-T, uh, my mother insists I'd spell it out so y'all don't get it mixed up with what it sounds like and sometimes smells like. When you're going through a shift, it's not always pleasant. But um, we try to help people get their shift together. That's why you watch us on, <laughs> on Monday night. <laughs> but at least it's holy. Shift, our shift, I believe the shift I went through was holy or wholesome. <laughs> it, it, as old folks say, it hoped me in my life. They meant that helped in me, but they, big mom name said, hope me out. And I'm happier, I'm, I'm healthier, I'm lighter in my spirit. But the one thing I recognized when I saw the movie, sitting back watching, and it was the first time I had seen it on camera in, as we were taping it in Atlanta, as they were filming it in Atlanta, was how angry I was. I, I didn't realize how angry I had become um, in the pulpit. I thought I was anointed, and a lot of times I was, but some of the times I was just annoyed. And I think a lot of preachers go through that and you don't realize how resentful you are preaching what, what uh, can really hurt you and what hurt people, hurts people and what seems like uh, absurdities. Voltaire, one of my favorite writers and thinkers, said those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. When I denounce hell, which is what that movie is about actually when they when I first told that story to this American life, it wasn't that I didn't believe in hell. I just didn't believe anybody would be in it because of what we call in Christianity the finished work of the Christ or the cross. That Jesus said, uh, Jesus came to atone for all sin and sinners. And the good news is that everybody's saved, but they don't know it until we tell them. So they act out something else. The gospel means good news. There's a there's millions of people who are called evangelicals that don't know that the word evangelion is the Greek word for gospel, and gospel means glad tidings or good news. Well, the good news is that the bad news is all wrong. And so we're trying to put that message out. But when you, when you believe in absurdities like eternal torture by a God whose mercy endures forever or who has everlasting love, and the scripture also says love keeps no records of wrong, uh, wrongs and that love uh, forgives if it doesn't forget. Uh, but the scripture does say that God throws our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. And some of you say, well, why are you always quoting scripture? Because you believe in it. You say, you're quoting scripture you don't believe in. You believe in it, some of y'all. That's why I use it. Because you keep throwing it at me. And I've done more study of it than many of you. Not all of you, but I've done a lot. I've spent my life. I majored in biblical literature, English Bible. I minored in theology and historical studies. I actually studied far more out of school than I did while in school. 
in the School of Divinity, Divinity, uh, Divinity at ORU and some of my um, postgraduate work at the Chicago Theological Seminary. Seminary. So seminary comes from the word semen. You get inseminated with whatever the doctrine of a particular church or religion or denomination embraces. So guys come out of there inseminated artificially or superficially sometimes, not spiritually. Your spiritual insemination comes from creation, from the way your soul responds to itself, the way your soul responds to its essence, the way your soul responds to spirit. And when you connect with that, it transcends religion, dogmas, doctrines, what you may call demons or disciplines. There's another realm. There's a truth that existed beyond, before, and besides your Bible or your Bhagavad Gita or your Quran or your Talmud or Torah. There is a reality. There is a spirituality. There's a mysticism. There's an essence that far ex ex extends beyond all of that and superimposes itself over what you can enjoy when you allow yourself to. So I've been into this a long time. Somebody asked the question, uh, Bishop Pearson, it seems you are more effective now than when you were in the middle of your ministry some 20 years ago. What do you mean by that? Uh, no, I understand what you're saying. Some people said I'm more infected now, but you're saying I'm effective, and, and why do you think that is? Whoever asked this question, it's a great question, it's a great observation, and I, I consider it somewhat of a compliment, because I'm not impersonating who I think people want me to be, and most people spend their lives impersonating who they think people want them to be, and they never get to know who they really are. You, you know the imposter, you've acted the role, you know the lines by route, you have remembered or memorized all the lines. You see, our world, including the church, is full of right answers to wrong questions. And I had mastered the right answers, but I became curious about the questions, whether they were valid or whether they were effectual, whether they had whether the answers to those questions would really make a change on this planet or this plane net, this plane of consciousness. And based on what I'm observing, no. I think that I'm, that I'm preaching to some of the less spiritually resolved, the more curious people, not those who suffer with a disease that I call over-certitude. You know too much, you think you know too much, you got it all together and you have the superior, I had it, this sort of elitist attitude that I condescendingly looked on the rest of the world. And it may sound like I'm doing that to fundamentalists. I don't mean to come across that way, except a little bit, because um, uh, y'all done, done a lot of damage, and I was part of that damage. We hurt a lot of people. Um, I think the, the, the world is full of, of, of psychosis, some kind of mental illness around religion. We become cult followers of Jesus, and I think Jesus would have resent that. He, he tried his best to get the people to repent, which means to rethink or to reconsider. It literally means after you thought, think again. Repentance doesn't mean to say, I'm sorry, oh God, I'm terrible, I'm sorry. We, don't, we got enough sorry people on the world. We don't, know about, we don't need no more sorry folks. We need some people who are willing to rethink what you believe and why you believe it. Like, like for if, if you, somebody walked up and just slapped you across the face violently and viciously, that would hurt, and I don't know if you turn the other cheek, but I might do it once, but then some other cheeks are going to be turning on that third hit. But if, if, if you slap me and say, I'm sorry, that's not enough. If you just, if your repentance means, oh, I'm sorry, Carl, I didn't mean to slap you. Uh, that doesn't mean you won't do it again. I don't want you to just say, I'm sorry. I want you to rethink. That's why people go to the pen, the tentary, to repent or to rethink. The, we need penal reform in our country and in our culture, which means when a person goes to the pen and repents or rethinks their life or why they do that and they go through some rehabilitative uh, experience, you let them out uh, to another area and then eventually into the free world. But we are creating monsters. I remember going, I remember going to a penitentiary. There were 6,000 prisoners in uh, Huntsville, Texas, Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, Dottie Rambo, my wife and I, we all went there and there were others with TV and we had cameras and there were thousands of prisoners. It was a very powerful and, and emotional experience, but they said, would you like to go to hell, Bishop? And I said, what do you mean by that? They said, it's way down in the basement. 
to the worst prisoners that we have behind two uh, uh, plexiglass walls. You can see through them, but you, they can't get to you. You can't get to them. I said, take me down. The further we got, the warmer I got. I started getting nauseous. I, I could smell human feces and urine when I got down there. And I saw this young man. I'll never forget him. He was completely nude, long dreads. Not that the dreads were anything wrong, but his, the way his hair was. And he, he had little pieces of torn newspaper all over the, the cell and feces smeared on the, the plexiglass. And... Uh, I just broke into tears. I mean, it so broke my heart. The first thing that came to my mind is that's some mama's son. It might be some woman's husband or some child's father. I don't know. And he looked, he could barely see through all the stuff on the glass. But I began to, in those days, as I would even now rebuke that evil conspiracy for his soul. And I put my hand up on the, the guards asked me not to, but I'd already put my hand. I just wanted to connect with that guy's spirit. He was insane. But that kind of situation would draw somebody to insanity. They lose their mind. We do that in prisons across this country because we don't know even what the word penitentiary means. And a lot of people are incarcerated, not in the physical sense, but in a mental sense, with religion or a job or some thinking process that, that captivates and um, hara holds their soul in hostage. That touches me very deeply, and I, I would like to see a change. So the things we're doing eventually will gain the kind of influence and prominence that we should be able to, to uh, if, you know, affect the way that people think. Anyway, thank you for, for saying that I'm more effective. I want to be more effective because I was be beginning to feel less and less and less effective, almost impotent. Uh, because it was a repetition. I felt like we were, we were not really growing as a church or a ministry. We were just getting fat. We were swapping sheep and recycling saints. And it was very spiritually incestuous, if you will. I call it homosectarianism, <laughs> same sect relationship, whether that's Islam, Judaism, Christianity, or some other religion. We need to spread out and meet with other people and have interfaith dialogues and uh, respect people as much as we can. All right. I just signed up for comemonday.org and love it. Thank you. I'm glad you do. We'll be getting a new video from you every Monday. Yes, you will be getting a new video. You got one, the first one today. And the next one's going to be on focus. Today's, this whole week is, is about fear. So you'll be getting an email every day. And you'll get a video on Monday. And the theme for the week is fear or fearlessness, dealing with fear. And uh, there's a scripture that says God has not given us a spirit of fear. That, the word spirit is an energy. Fear is a spirit. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. The NIV translation, which I refer to later, would say self-discipline. And um, so we're going we're gonna to do that every week, and then we'll do focus. We'll be integrity. We'll do endurance, whatever. But it'll be something edifying. In, in other words, it builds, and you know, an edifice is a building. So when I say edify, it means build you up. Raise your consciousness. Elevate your spirit. And lots of other things come along with joining in the... Uh, the um, the, and I don't want to be exclusive, but we have a group of people that are really signing up and registering to not only listen to us on Monday nights live, but read our newsletter. We'll have pictures and stories and articles. Uh, we'll have cruises and seminars and events around the country. You're going to have a wonderful time. So let's go to the, uh, the uh, comemonday.org promo, and it'll tell you more about that since you made reference to it. I'm glad you joined. Thanks for being a part of our family, and welcome to it. We'll go to the promo, and then we'll see don't cut me off short. That's what my <laughs> that was what my mom used to say when you hung up the phone and she'd call you, but don't cut me off short. Um, anyway, we're gonna go to this promo and then we're gonna come back to some of that electrifying music that you've enjoyed by this precious young Brianna and um, Parker. Parker. They're gonna park right up here with that guitar and <laughs> sing. All right, we'll be back in a second. <laughs> Hello everybody, I'm Carlton Pearson and I am so excited about the beginning of Come Monday org. Come Sunday was the movie. Come Monday is the movement into broader enlightenment and life. And as a member of Come Monday, you'll receive one video each Monday for the entire year. That's 52 videos in total that you'll receive every Monday morning to get your week started out on a positive and powerful note. I will also be sending you one each email each day, Monday through Friday, that will support the thought of the week. 
That's 260 emails throughout the entire year to inspire the genius inside of you. We will also provide a private Facebook group so that we can all come together in a safe environment and discuss personal, pertinent, powerful issues. You will also receive a digital monthly newsletter full of interesting updates and current events and exciting pictures. And I also want to offer you special VIP access to all of my events when I'm in a city near you, because I love to meet my people. <laughs> and finally, we'll offer special pricing to cruises, concerts, live events, all for standing with us and becoming a Come Monday member. So sign up now at the special introductory rate of just $3 a month. That's just $36 for everything for an entire year. I think I'm going to sign up for that myself. You're on your way to greater enlightenment. I want to meet you there in consciousness. So go to your phones and computers now. Sign up and meet me come Monday. Thank you. We're finished. Can you believe our, an hour has gone by, even though we started a little bit late? Really enjoy being with you tonight. It's always a pleasure. I feel like you're actually in the studio or that I'm in your living room asking for a piece of fruit or whatever you got on your table, or maybe a cup of tea. We're going we're gonna to finish the program with uh, Brianna and Parker uh, and their excellent music. The information how, of how to reach them online is on the screen or should be. So let's... Let's go out tonight with this precious young couple that have so much to offer. You guys are wonderful. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks. And I'm applauding. There's thousands of people applauding right now. <laughs> Sing it. You've been away for a long time. I've been holding it down at home Far and wide, you've been traveling Doing God knows what I don't know Oh, but let me show you how good it can be With just a house in the country the world is gonna be what it'll be It's got nothing on you and me When I was young, I had that wanderlust And I know you've got it still No one ever showed you just how good it could be when you settle yourself, but I will Oh, let me show you how good it can be With just a house in the country The world is gonna be what it'll be It's got nothing Little white house with a big maple tree mm, In the backyard where the kids can play Screened in porch with a slow spinning fan mm, And a cold glass of iced tea Oh, let me show you how good it can be gonna be what it'll be it's got nothing on you and me oh it's got nothing on you and me thank you guys so, so kuma ain't that beautiful all righty are we done uh, good night, y'all. I suppose, <laughs> suppose y'all already gone. <laughs>